I was a freshman at Princeton, and I didn't really have any intention of starting a social business. But I dropped out of school eight years ago because I just fell in love with the concept of garbage. Our major global solution for garbage, put it in a pile or burn it. These are not sophisticated solutions. And that's how TerraCycle came to be, to help eliminate the idea of waste by making things that are non-recyclable, recyclable. Can a plastic bag technically be recycled? 100%. Can a candy wrapper? 100%. And we do it. We're the biggest collector and processor of wrappers, chip bags, and other flexible packaging in the world. But you need a unique system because on its own, the economics don't work. Our collectors are the most vital aspect of our business. We have close to 26 million people sending us this waste. And that whole cost is funded by major consumer product companies because they found that the public was craving a solution to their waste. There's a potential new thing. What is that? Fire hose. We were thinking of accessories. Fire hose pothole. Our team of scientists and our team of designers look at every type of waste stream and identify what are the solutions for each one, because really each type of garbage has a different heartbeat. Juice pouches become backpacks. Chip bags can melt into an injection moldable plastic. And with dirty diapers, the super absorbent polymer ends up being used in the farming industry, so the soil has better water retention. And the plastic is made into something like a park bench. We have evaluated every consumer waste stream, and every type of garbage has a solution. Now, of course, if we stopped buying stuff, none of these problems would exist. We are on a consumption fix. Our grandparents, they had way less stuff. When you bought a table, you would buy it with an intention of having it passed down to your kids and their kids and so on. Then we went out of a Great Depression. We went into the biggest global war we have ever seen, and we wanted to rebound from that. The idea of consumption and the idea of disposable products solved the failure in the economy. I don't think TerraCycle would have succeeded 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but we're tapping into this desire that is so deep amongst everyone to do the right environmental thing. We're collecting millions of pieces of waste every day. And so while people are addicted to consumption, and so am I, we are willing to try to solve it. Every single object in this office is garbage. And it really is there to inspire people to feel like they can come up with anything and run with it. Maybe it won't work, maybe it will. Only uh, putting it out there will allow us to know. How you doing? Thank you. So we're going to talk today quite a bit, or we have talked today quite a bit at the conference about how do we really optimize sales, create more consumerism, and so on. And I'm a big part of this, but I want to just take a step back and think about what happens to everything, and how do we create value around something that we view as really a major issue. So let's talk about the problem of garbage. Uh, and I think the best way to talk about it is not talk about first how do we recycle it, reuse it, or different things, but why does garbage even exist? And it's important to reflect on the fact that garbage doesn't exist in nature whatsoever. It simply is a human idea. So why does it exist? And I would argue that it only came about in the past 100 years or so. It exists because of two fundamental th things that we invented as human beings. The first is that we've become very innovative, and we make products of ever-increasing complexity. You know, if you look back 100 years and before that, our objects were made, you know, our food was or, uh, made from organic materials, our furniture was made from wood, our clothing was made from cotton, stuff nature knew what to do with. But today, if you look around, first, I mean, look around the room here, every single thing, whether it's the chair you're sitting on, the clothing you're wearing, the uh, projector, the screens, everything will become garbage one day. But very few things are made from natural materials. Our shoes are all synthetic, our chair is entirely synthetic, and so on and so forth. Then we compound that by consuming way, way, way more than we ever consumed before. If you compare someone alive today, compare me to maybe someone alive 100 years ago, today we consume 10 times more stuff than we did 100 years ago. Then you add that to the fact that the human population has more or less grown by an order of magnitude. In the past 100 years, we consume now 100 times more as a species than we did before. 
And we have to feed ourselves before, have a roof over our heads, have all these things. So what we buy today is stuff that creates pleasure, not stuff that we need to survive. Now, I'm going to promise to talk about all the negatives about garbage first and then look at how we can be positive about it. First, garbage is a major issue. It's 5 billion tons a year. Today, 25% of that material still ends up in our oceans. There's not one big ocean gyre in the Pacific Ocean, but there's five. They're the size of Texas. They don't even look like the image you see behind me because the material, these plastics, have degraded into a mush uh, of tiny particles. Now, 25% ends up in our oceans, 5% globally is recycled, which leaves 75%, which is either burned or buried. Either uh, a burying would be sending to a landfill, uh, which is the most popular global solution, and burning uh, would be uh, something like incinerating for energy, which is popular in Germany, Japan, Switzerland, and so on. Now, the reason we burn or bury our waste is not because we don't want to try to create value from it, it's because it's exceptionally complicated and there's so many different types of waste that it's very expensive to sort it out. So how do we solve this? The first thing is everything I'm going to show you today is not the answer. It's sort of like a band-aid on a big, gigantic issue. The real answer is how we consume differently. And from the bottom to the top, the best thing we can do as individuals is first buy consciously. And let me show you practical examples of this. Buying consciously would be like buying a refill pouch instead of a normal bottle or using reusable containers. Then the next best, if you believe in that, is to buy durable instead of disposable. Things like CFL light bulbs instead of incandescent light bulbs, uh, uh, alkaline batteries instead of zinc batteries, and so on. Then the next best, if you believe in that, is if it's durable, it ought to be on the used market. eBay's a great example of that. And then the very best thing, and probably the hardest thing of all, and it's deeply ironic as well, is simply to not buy anything at all. Now, companies like Patagonia actually have advertised this and created real value for their equity, where they say, don't buy our jacket because it's so durable, you can find it on eBay. And it actually works quite well for them. So I want to tell you a little bit about the story of TerraCycle. It all started 11 years ago in our dorm room in Princeton, and my friends and I decided to grow certain plants in the basement. You can see the young versions there. Now you know who the one pot smoker in the audience is. And, you know, as, as guys 19 years old, we had no idea how to grow plants, let alone ones that were inside and had to be taken care of really well, or they would turn male and, you know, they're no good then. And we realized that the answer to us came in waste. We started taking organic waste. This is the waste left over from our dining halls. We invented a machine where we would feed them to worms. This is our great worm conversion machine. And the plants would do incredibly well. You can imagine that was really inspiring for us. And I thought about you know, leaving school and creating a business that was focused on how to take organic waste, feed it to worms, and sell it. The challenge was no one would invest in our business. And uh, since we had no money, we decided, could we take this uh, idea of leveraging garbage and apply it to more things than just our content? Our first product we ever launched was liquid worm poop in a used soda bottle. Every aspect of this gar product here is garbage. Uh, the bottles are directly used bottles. They've never been melted, as you can see from the finished product example. The inside is organic waste fed to worms and liquefied. Even the trigger heads are leftovers from major companies, because when P&G or SC Johnson change a trigger head, because the fashion changes, then there's millions and millions thrown out. The, actually, the only part of this product that is new is the label, because we had to find a heat form label that would fit to Coke and Pepsi and other bottles. Now, we learned a lot of lessons here. We first learned that it's not legal to go people, uh, sorry, through people's garbage. I ended up spending a night in jail reflecting on that. The second is that there is the idea of intellectual property rights of garbage. I mean, I had no idea this would be the case, but it turned out that the lawyers at Coca-Cola and Pepsi uh, contacted us after we put this out at Walmart and other stores saying, you can't do that. It's our prior, you know, uh, 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 shape. It's our intellectual property. So we now uh, boast the only license from both Pepsi and Coca-Cola to package shit in their distinctive shape and sell it at major retail. <laughs> Thank you. But one of the questions, I think, in business that we always have to ask is, what's the purpose of the business? Now, anyone in like an MBA situation would say, well, the purpose is profits. The purpose is return to shareholders. 
And I think profit is important, but I don't personally think that's the purpose of business. I think the purpose of business is what we create, what product we sell. Does that help people? Does that make life better? Or what service do we provide? Does that help people? Does that elevate the human experience? And so we started thinking about this as we grew, and we said, well, worm poop in a soda bottle is a great thing, but can we extend this concept to any form of waste? And we had a big turning point five years ago and uh, decided to diversify very aggressively. Now, before I go on and show you that, uh, we're right now filming the second season of our television show called Human Resources. It's on the Pivot channel. And I'm going to play you a little clip so you can get a sense of what life at TerraCycle is about. If we can play the video, please. Is this on? What's this red light mean? Is that? I think, wait? Yeah. No, that's me. We're in. OK. All right. So if you're watching this, you're one of our international team members. And we're excited to host you next week for TerraCycle's International Week here in Trenton, New Jersey. But we wanted to make you this film to introduce you to the people who make up TerraCycle US. So come along. Crush it. That's what I do. What TerraCycle does is we make things that are non-recyclable, nationally recyclable. Every single challenge that comes to TerraCycle is one that no one in the world has ever solved before. Our major global solution for garbage, put it in a pile. How can we change the garbage to make it into something new? We today collect millions of cell phones, ink cartridges, all the way to clothing like shoes that can all be easily reused. And you've got Transform trash. For 10 years in a row, we have only grown. We operate in 23 countries. Everything we did, we invented. How do we eliminate the concept of waste? I don't want you to take this the wrong way because you're really good at it, but do you ever not talk in sound bites? And let me just do some quick introductions to everyone. This is our account management team. International Week is a thing that TerraCycle has done now for three or four years in a row. It's an opportunity for us to bring all of our offices from all around the world here for a week of team building and getting to know each other. So the first person I want to introduce you to is Stefan. My name is Steven Katz. I work in the material sales department at TerraCycle. He uh, uh, just recently joined the science department. Is there anything that you want to share with the people from International Week? Only that I've been here for a year and a half. This company is an ultra-modern company, if that exists. There's yoga every other day. They can just work out, enjoy, let off a little steam. Just this morning, I had a Nerf gun fight with an intern just because I didn't like the way he was working. Now, we're going to go over here. Tom has a very broad vision. Because he's so smart and because he's a genius, he has trouble relating with us normal people. I believe Tom is probably the youngest boss I've ever worked for. It's like working for my kid. Now we go to the cage. Notice that it's actually a fully operational cage where we could lock people, partly because of who's inside. Finance department, this is Donna. I think if everybody cut out the stupid yoga and bringing their dogs to work, we would be more productive and we'd probably make a lot more money. Hi, International Week team. Al, are you uh... having a scotch? So my dad's Al, he's the general counsel here. It's six o'clock Friday night. I feel like I'm entitled. Al is like a bulldog. Bloated, self-righteous asshole. I mean, the guy's got a baseball bat in his office. And we have Andrew, who hey just lost his goatee. Yeah, you got like a whole baby thing going on now. <sighs> anyway, gives you a little taste of what it's all about. <laughs> so now I promise to talk only about garbage positively. If we look at garbage, everything does become waste one day, but some things can be recycled, some things can't. What can be recycled is typically paper, aluminum, glass, PET, and HDPE. The key question is why? Why are only those things recyclable and everything else, from our shoes to our sunglasses to our clothing, not recyclable? And I can tell you now it has nothing to do with the technical capacity of the waste. It has everything to do with money, as usually things do. The reason an aluminum can is recyclable is because aluminum is valuable, and the cost of collecting it and processing it is less than the value of the aluminum. But everything else from a piece of chewing gum to a cigarette butt can be recycled, and we do it. But it costs more to collect and process than chewing gum plastic or cigarette butt plastic is worth. Here's the best way to look at it. You know, I have a chance to go to companies all the time and tell them how to make their products recyclable. And the way we begin that question is always, well, if you made your product out of solid gold, I guarantee not one piece would ever end up in a garbage can, no matter what it was, sunglasses to uh, a tennis racket. And it's, that's what it comes down to. It's all about value. So if you want to look at garbage differently, and remember, every object you sell one day will be garbage. That's just a golden rule of life. Is if we break it down into three different components, 
One being what it's made from. What is that object made from? Second, which is its composition. What does uh, those, comp those materials look like, being the features? And third, usually a very overlooked idea, is what is the idea of the compositions and the features looking like that object? If it's a bottle, the idea is to hold a cold beverage, and so on and so forth. And if you look at waste this way, you can suddenly unlock the magic of circular solutions. And I can tell you every object in the world, anything that you sell on any website you have, can go through a circular process if you think about it differently. The very, very best thing to do with waste is the idea of reuse. Now, you guys may know uh, uh, platforms like Gazelle and others that collect e-waste and refurbish it. It's a huge, multi-billion dollar industry around the world collecting iPhones or cell phones and laptops and so on. We do that as well. Easy to refurbish. Same with apparel. But let me try to show you sort of a world of unusual reuse. Obviously, worm poop in a soda bottle is one example, our first one, but here's how that expanded. And if you look at the product in the middle, it's just an upside-down two-liter soda bottle. Uh, with bird food inside and turned out to be the best-selling bird feeder at Walmart for a few years, uh, uh, five years ago. Or here's an example with Unilever where we took 35 million used butter tubs or margarine tubs, put a hole in the bottom, and all the plants in all the Walmarts in California decided to stop selling plants in those black, flimsy, non-recyclable containers and move to used margarine packaging. Now, Here's an example that you'll see launch very soon, where we're going to be working with a large fabric care company, collecting the caps, and for the first time in history, you'll see the first reused cap on one of the largest fabric care brands in the world. Now, reuse is limited to about 1% of the objects that exist, but imagine on your platforms, if you looked at not just selling these materials or these products, but collecting them back, what type of value could you create? Now, if reuse is not possible, consider upcycling. Upcycling is where you value the material and the features of a product, but not the intention. Everything I'm going to show you here, whether it's pet food bags made into pet products, or corks into uh, uh, cork boards, circuit boards, vinyl records, all of these products are using garbage and creating mass-produced outcomes that sell incredibly well, whether it's shower curtains made from granola bags, uh, speakers uh, made from candy wrappers, stationary products, Pens, now you'll laugh, this seems like a dinky product, yet 10 million of these were sold last year in Latin America. Um, whether it's movie film, whether it's juice pouches into soccer balls, whether it's shoes, and so on and so forth. Upcycling can take you into a lot of unique places, even fun objects, like these are two dresses that we made that are in museums, and that one, for example, was a lot of hard work to put the uh, material together for. <laughs> now, you, now you get it. Um, even our offices around the world, we're in 26 countries, and we found that if you make an office entirely out of garbage, it's cheaper interior design than any other way to make that office. And it creates a phenomenal amount of inspiration for your team. Here's what our office in Trenton, New Jersey looks like. And if you're in the area, come by, we'll give you a tour. But it extends, whether it's our office in Germany, or Toronto, Canada, or Sao Paulo, Brazil, or London in the UK, and so on and so forth. It creates a lot of fun and saves you money when you think about garbage, because garbage is something people are willing to pay you for. Now, if upcycling is not available, recycling is the next option. That's where you value only the material that something is made from. This toy may look familiar to you. It's with Hasbro, Mr. Potato Head, but he's a unique version. He's made entirely, 100% from used, post-consumer potato chip bags. Everything, whether it's things that people never thought could be recycled, can be. Unequivocally, everything can be. It's just a question of money. You can do really interesting things with the products that you sell if you collect them back, whether it's taking shampoo bottles and making them into community gardens around the US or flip-flops into playgrounds. Even complicated things, like making, if you look at the pen example, the world's first pen made from used pens. Or if you think you know, that's the limit of the complication, how about five trucks that were made for the Super Bowl this past February made 40% from used chip bags? The only plastic in here that wasn't replaced with used chip bags are the thermodynamic plastics in the engine, because that would have taken a little bit more R&D than we had time for. Everything fundamentally can be solved. The key question, though, isn't the solution. The key question is, how do we collect it? Because the reason we burn or bury our waste is because it's complicated. The only way to create solutions to all the products that we sell is to collect them back in a coherent way, where you just get toothbrushes back, where you just get sunglasses, or you just get dirty diapers, then anything and everything can be solved. 
So the key question isn't the solution, it's how do you collect the material? And everyone here is in the position to do so because you already run these systems selling these products. What if you thought about not just selling, but actually taking them back and using that value to boost your business? Collection can work in many different ways. I'm just going to show you a few examples of what TerraCycle does, but that's not what it's limited to. Here's one example that we operate in 26 countries where you can go to our website, sign up for one of 60 different waste streams to collect, depends on market by market, whether it's in Japan all the way to here in the US. You start collecting that waste in a box, download a free shipping label, very simple API functionality with UPS or another shipping carrier, send it in uh, to our warehouse, and then we try to give some incentive. In the US, we give two cents for every piece of waste collected on average which results in millions of dollars on, of donations on an annual basis. And when you start engaging your consumers, not just in selling to them, but in making them a part of the entire supply chain and owning the negative that comes from the product, when it becomes waste, you create an incredible relationship with your consumers, much more than a linear one, a much more circular one. Today, for example, 75% of American schools run our platforms like this, collecting everything from chip bags to other things. And they don't just collect like this. They then go a little crazy and build these monuments to your product. And then teachers go psychotic and start dressing like garbage, teaching how you can create a better world uh, uh, with what we have today. Just for time, I'm going to skip over this. So we've now operated all over the world. And we look at how do we bring different methods of collection, whether it's collecting in retail, which is now in 70,000 stores, or even uh, a new platform, which I'm really excited about, where we just launched this in Vancouver recently, where you can now get a catalog of zero waste bags. Here's an example of one for non-recyclable kitchen waste, but it exists for any type of waste you can imagine. You take your zero waste bag, you put it into directly into your recycling bin. So here's the old version of garbage. Here's the new one, where you can have a zero waste bag for every type of garbage that exists. Put it in uh, your recycling bin, gets picked up, then sorted out at the municipal recycling facility, sent to us. And for the first time in modern consumerist history, you can have every object in your home without any exception, from human hair to hygiene products, completely recycled. Human hair is great for compost, by the way. And dirty diapers can easily be melted into things like park benches once they're sterilized and separated. What's really fun, though, when you start thinking about waste differently is you change your perspective on garbage from one of a liability, one of an issue, one that we want to pay to get rid of, to something of value, something that you can create consumer engagement on and really change this linear consumption cycle we have into something significantly more profound and circular. Here's a fun example. This is more of like a promotional idea where we created a thing we call a butt sack. Um, and it's an aluminum pouch, very simple, with a shipping label printed on it. Now millions of these are being given away at NASCAR and other events all over the world where you could put in your cigarettes. I mean, hopefully you don't smoke. And again, the answer to cigarette waste is stop smoking. But still, 22% of the world's population does smoke, unfortunately. So for them, you can put your cigarettes in these pouches, and then your mailbox, your uh, USPS mailbox, becomes your recycling bin. But this may seem fun and you know, not that impactful. But these small steps lead to massive change. I can't tell you which brand, but either number one or number two of the world's largest tobacco brands have committed that by 2015, they're changing, and it's already in production, 1 billion packages per year to integrate the butt sack into it. So when you've smoked, you take your cigarette, put it in the bottom. Then when you're done, you take the cover off where you have like the health warnings and dying person and everything, peel it off, rotate it around, and then you see a shipping label and you put that in the mail. And here's an example where now, instead of making the consumption experience linear, it's been transformed to something completely circular. So. I hope that you, as you think about the experience that you're building for your clients or if you're running your own e-commerce locations as well, to think about not just this linear approach where we just create a product, market it really well, sell it really well, and get it to the consumer in as many units as possible, but instead do that and also think about how you can engage the consumer all the way through to what happens when it's done because a lot of magic can be unlocked in that process. So with that said, I hope you're thinking about garbage just a little differently today. Thank you. Thank you.